Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us for this Object Matrix and Marquis broadcast webinar. Uh, we will be talking about the secure media focused Object Matrix Matrix Store Cloud uh, along with the powerful workflow uh, tools Project Parking. Uh, my name is Mark Haberfield, I'm pre-sales engineer here at Object Matrix and on with me today is Simon Fern, product manager for Marquis Broadcast. Hello. We've got a pretty good turnout here, people from Australia, Spain, uh, Belgium, across Europe and UK, which is quite nice to see. Um, but just to let you know, we are recording this so it will be available later with all the slides and uh, feel free to pop any questions in the chat window along the way if you've got any for us and we'll answer as we go along. So today we are going to be doing our introduction to both the companies um, and both the products and we'll have a little insight into the integration the technical side, how we uh, combine the two together and then we'll dive straight into a demo um, so you'll see the matrix store and some of the tools uh, along with the um, Marquis uh, broadcast project parking and how that is connected to the matrix store cloud uh, in a live demo. So any Q&A at the end as well, any questions you think about, uh, like I said, in the window or uh, should go or feel free to wait until the end. So I'll start the ball rolling with Object Matrix. Uh, just for those on the line who don't know us, uh, we are a company, software company, start, started back in 2003 um, from sunny South Wales. And we, we are pioneers of object storage bit of a, a strong claim that one but my bosses did help build what is considered the first object storage um, and that is still used today uh, for a lot of our, our records and our things. Um, since then we've become an award-winning company um, and we focused on the media workflows. Um, the reason for that was that um, it's just where object storage lends itself and we were particularly early to market. Um, for those of you who remember back in 2005 we actually created one of the first cloud object storages uh, and delivered it to the Belgian market and of course far too early to market because no one knew what object storage was or cloud or things back in 2005. Um, so we had a bit of a, a run through various things but we've got a track record of revolutionizing you know, media workflows and uh, accessing and sharing content. So here's our company milestones where we started um, back in the early days um, and then in 2006 putting those first creative workflows um, the first media company starting to keep their films and some of their um, uh, digital assets all on Matrix Store um, out there. We then had a bit of a, a lull across the orange section there, but we brought out a few new tools. It gave us a chance to develop our um, interfaces to file systems, file system to object, uh, and then of course we brought out our first Avid integrations and our Avid customers as well. From there, we've just grown and grown. Our customers have driven our work, our um, applications. It's all been tweaked for the media work industry, uh, and particularly those awards in 2019, um, and 200 customers globally now, um, from tennis channels to sports to news channels to post houses, um, and even banks, energy companies, and um, parliaments as well. So what is the product? The product is Matrix Store. Um, it's an object storage, um, and nowadays we call it the Matrix Store Cloud as well, because it's a private cloud. It's a cloud whether it sits on-prem, in a data center, or it's our Matrix Store Cloud. Um, and it's there to provide access to your data. Um, it's secure, safe, multiple copies, um, and very much along the business continuity side of things. We've been talking about DR and business continuity uh, all the way since 2005. Uh, and of course with recent times this has certainly become more and more important along with the remote working as well the ability to work from anywhere um, and see those legacy archives without having to send uh, engineers and PPE into their post houses to load a, a tape for example. It's also been future proof we've uh, always used commodity enterprise hardware so you can scale it um, the workflows always adapt and working with partners such as Marquis we've been able to adapt the systems over time and make sure you've constantly got access to the content and the metadata and we're not proprietary anyway make sure that content and metadata is available to you at all times. So as it deployed well I mentioned quickly a lot of people a lot of customers will have an on-prem private cloud um, but with more and more disaster recovery options people will also have a remote location 
and that can either be a second office which is great for collaboration and um, we've got replication built in it's been built in from the very beginning um, so that's just seamlessly making sure the data is in two physical locations so if you've got a, an office unavailable whether that's due to a protest or you know a temporary power outage that's then all available in the second location and more importantly that's all available via remote access so remote teams can just log in using certain tools without the need for expensive VPNs or tunneling equipment um, you've got direct access to your matrix stores more recently in the UK we've produced matrix store cloud and that's now developed down into South Africa and we're trying to get our um, next matrix store cloud out in France Belgium and the US hopefully very soon um, but actually we're finding Spain and the US and other countries are using the UK Matrix Store Cloud and they're finding it perfectly fine. Uh, and again, it can just be that second copy built in replication to the Matrix Store Cloud from a local one um, to make sure you've got that full disaster recovery business continuity and availability of those assets in minutes, not in hours or days. The obligatory customer slide, uh, just to tell you who we've uh, allowed to present to you. Um, there's companies in there with video on demand systems, broadcasters, news channels, um, sports channels, and like I said, a few um, banks and um, parliaments, etc. in there. But again, they're media workflows. They're making sure you've got the data and the video data that they need to keep track. Because realistically, every company is now becoming a media company in some way, even if it's just stills or videos of uh, the office party. So I'll hand over to Simon now to tell us a bit more about Marcus. Hello everyone. Uh, yes, so Marcus have been um, going since the late 1990s. Um, we moved into, into software in the very early 2000s, so we've been working for well over um, 15 years on software development and the area that we're obviously best known for is our integrations into Babbit environments. Um, these days we've broke, um, spread that out now, so we have a work uh, with a lot of the other vendors as well. So we have solutions for FCP and for Premier and Adobe products as well as the Avid ones. Um, today I'm really going to be focusing on Project Parking, which is a tool within the Avid world. And it's now been, been going for many years. And as we say here, we now know that we're managing well over 70 petabytes worth of Avid storage worldwide. Um, it's the kind of base we have for the worldwide business within Project Parking. Uh, go to the next slide, please. And we're spread across um, many customers, um, as I say, worldwide. A lot of these customers are using Project Parking, some are using our integration products, um, but we have a very um, large customer base, all using, using these very mature and very well-used product products. Uh, next slide, please. As I say, today I'm mainly going to be focusing on Project Parking and on workflows around the management of Avid projects, and we'll show the capability of Project Parking to do archives and backups of Avid projects going across to external storage um, and show how simple it is for people to work through those processes, um, but then also to break it out to show how that can be expanded upon. So as well as being a tool for just the local use, it's also a tool that can be used for remote working and to make things very easy for people to collaborate with projects based around centralized storage, in this case, obviously the object matrix storage. Next slide, please. So, so just to quickly talk about the integration then, um, the Project Parking application has an S3 interface, and as you all know, Matrix Store also is available as an S3 interface. Uh, well, we put the two together, and that allows Project Parking um, to work seamlessly with the Matrix Store. Um, the beauty of using the S3 interface, of course, is not only have you got the, the ability to tie in your on-prem edit storages, You've also got the ability to use those remote store remote users um, via the S3 and the internet protocols. Yes, and, and this workflow it clearly shows the kind of the integration that we'll, I'll, I'll be demonstrating about the ability to add in remote working into the basic systems. So project parking in its simplest um, iterations can be managing the content from the online edit storage and moving the projects and the media into the Matrix Store cloud. Um, but once it's in that centralized cloud location, we can use either project parking or this solo parking option um, in remote sites to allow users to access that content and bring it down and work on it remotely and also push changes back into that centralized storage. And they can be using project parking if they're running off 
avid shared storage systems, or the considerably cheaper solo parking if they're running on standalone avids with local storage, and will handle any conversion between the media fold and folder structures in the background so they don't have to worry about that. So it's very easy to take the basic principles and basic workflows that we have for budget parking and expand that out to effectively a worldwide collaborative workflow. Thank you. Great. Well, the reason you're all here to actually see it working live, um, I'll typically show you some of the features of Matrix Store and we'll talk through some of the, the core concepts. So with Matrix Store, we're built up of nodes. They're storage nodes. But the beauty of that is it's a cluster, which means you can add and remove nodes as you need them. That means we can keep adding customers' uh, nodes throughout uh, your lifespan. And we've got customers who've had uh, systems for over 10 years. They've added extra new hardware in, seamlessly taking the old hardware off and without any downtime. Um, means it's future-proof and keeping that metadata and data uh, completely um, safe. The system is basically running lots of tasks in the background, keeping those data um, and objects bit for bit perfect. They're constantly checking each other uh, against um, the hashes and the checksums and making sure the data is bit for bit perfect. And of course, we've got built-in audits uh, to be able to see who's using the cluster at what level for how long. Standard user groups and Active Directory stuff that uh, allows you some granularity on how the how the various people can access the vaults. When you hear me talk about vaults, this is where we start applying our matrix store policies. Vaults could be considered buckets or workspaces. Um, in our case, each vault is accessible via S3. Uh, and I can just give it a name, a capacity. I can set up the audits. I can build, uh, use built-in trash cans. Uh, not many storages have built-in trash can, although we're all used to it on our desktops. Uh, we've now got it built into the matrix store, but with an auto clean feature in there so that you decide how long the trash cans are kept, uh, whether that's forever for a manual purge or 7, 14, 20 days. The beauty of a cluster is we've got lots of CPUs in there, which means they get a bit bored at times. So with Matrix Store, we decided to get them doing some work. We're in the media industry. Our customers want media metadata. A lot of assets already have media metadata on them, so we started extracting it and making it available to the end user. We call it process in place, and that grabs out the simple image or media, camera info, etc. But if it spots XMP or an IMF file, um, or even some of the AS11, AS10 formats, we'll extract that and make it useful to the end user and available to the end users. Last thing I mentioned, just we've got replication built in. It's vault by vault, which means that you can um, allow the data to flow in different directions using vaults as that. Thing, and you can decide which data. So the most important archive, you might want to make sure that's in two, three, two or three places using replication. But with um, your, your transient data, your, your on-the-fly stuff, you probably just want to keep that in one location so you don't need the replication. The beauty of having it as a policy as well means there's no extra scanning. There's no overhead on the system. Basically, a new object arrives in this vault. The replication is um, on, therefore it knows this uh, object also needs to be somewhere else as well. So I won't bore you with more of the admin stuff, just to say that there's lots of interfaces and we enable or disable them in there, um, whether that's file system, Samba, NFS um, and others. What I will talk about is the analytics. Um, it's more and more important these days to know what data is and where your data is. And so we produce an entire suite of analytics. Uh, we call it Sense. It's a Sense database of what's happening in your matrix store. It's the only time you'll hear me talk about databases because with object storage, we don't keep databases. The object is the data and metadata, um, but we do keep a database, a database of stats. We've got some, obviously, cluster overview and some details about what's happening in the nodes, etc. But now, more and more importantly, people want to know the actual um, fault statistics. Who is accessing the vault over what time period, how much data is flowing in and out, and how does the data look over time, who's reading and writing, etc. And that's all available through these statistics. Um, this is getting better and better all the time. We can now start to look at individual applications and how they're actually hitting the system. If I look at vision overview, for example, um, we can see in the last few days there's been a few little spikes here and there um, in the last few hours, but if I take it out to a longer time period, you can probably see a fair bit of data usage uh, at various times. So you can normally see the working day spikes up quite nicely with the uses, etc. 
So what is vision? Well, vision is a lightweight look into your matrix store. It's only into your matrix store. It doesn't look at other systems, but it's um, a great way to visualize your assets. Again, you could present this to the internet, uh, and in fact, we do present it to the internet, uh, in our case, with our true matrix store cloud. But this is my private cloud, I should say. This is my on-prem version, and the other one is my off-prem version. You can see assets in there, and if they're videos, we can have proxies generated, and we can make them available to people in the long run. So I'll quickly show you our, our matrix store cloud. This is the one that's uh, in our London data centers, and this is the one that we present with several customers all sharing the same data, uh, data center matrix store. Um, but in my case, I've got a few vaults that I've set up for myself to do demos, etc. And there are other vaults on here, but they have no idea these ones are here, and I can never see their vaults because it's all controlled um, in the admin tool under the spaces. More importantly, it's these Marcus ones, and these are the ones that Simon has configured uh, to back up his thing. So if I went to the remote edit demo one, for example, I can see the media has been coming in and uh, backing up from his machine. And I get really deep into it, I'll probably find some videos and those videos uh, have proxies generated so in the worst case scenario I can come into here grab my assets from anywhere and carry on working true business continuity so plenty of features in here as well things like um, get links and attachments and uh, various things I can do with the data um, including adding extra metadata etc if it's not the stuff that uh, has already been extracted or inserted uh, by Marquis. So what I'll do, I'll hand over to Mark Simon now and uh, I'll let him show you how it looks from his side and how he put it into the matrix store. Thank you very much. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, so, so hopefully everyone can see my screen now. You can indeed. Okay, so this is Project Parking. Um, Project Parking, for anyone who hasn't seen it before, is a Windows application, and um, it's configured to look into where your Avid projects are. We'll show you your Avid projects, um, and we'll pick up the details of any locally attached workspaces and storage um, that those projects are working with. Then from a user's point of view, when they're looking to kick off um, an archive process, it's as simple as finding a project that they want to work with, choosing the archive button, and going through and building in the details. So everything we do um, is based around reading through the AVID project, understanding how the projects and the bins work and how they reference media. And we're allowed to choose how much you're going to work with, so you can take an entire project or just an individual bin from a project, whatever you want, um, and then choose the destination to go to. In this case, we're convicted into the object matrix cloud. That is pointing to one of the vaults, so we're configured to go directly into the vault or the bucket in the S3 speak. Um, and we'll put the content directly into there. When you're using multiple vaults or buckets, we'll make multiple configurations and the user can choose which one to go through and send the content through to. There are various detailed options we can um, go through to fine tune what we're going to do, but at the basic level, we just choose the destination um, and hit the start button. When we do the archive, we read through the bin files, we read through the project files, and we work out all of the media files that are in use within that project, and we'll copy them across to that location. Um, if we've already done it once, we can do it again multiple times, and every time we make that archive, we'll do the deltas, we'll do what's changed, what's new in the system. So any new media files that have been added, we'll copy those in, but we'll always take a new snapshot of the project files themselves. So in this case, we can see that my project is already in the archive, so we know that we only have to do an update to that archive, in which case we'll go through and we'll take a new version. Um, and we'll send that up into the archive. So at this point in time, we'll know from checking that the media files are already there. So all we'll need to do is take up the new version of the project files. Now, because I'm working from home, that will go through quite slowly. But the, um, we'll let that carry on in the background. So the archive principle is very straightforward, it's very simple, and they'll go through and be able to send that um, up to the cloud. As soon as it's up there, we'll be able to use the archive and store tab, and we'll see the contents of the archive. We'll see at the moment the version that's already there, 
hand-linear versions that were done previously. So that one's been archived a few times already. Um, at the point of doing any restore, it's just a question of choosing the version you want to bring back. Let's go from one from yesterday um, and go through the restore point, at which point we'll read back the details of that archive from the cloud storage um, and we'll build up the details of what's available. Um, and then you'll choose to bring back the entire project or the individual bins again. So that will allow you to go through and build up that simple workflow to archive and restore the content. Now in terms of um, the main use cases of why we would look, people would look to do this, there are kind of three main, main um, reasons. Oh, sorry. That's my restore window. I'll come back to that one in the next part of the demo. Um, the main justifications or reasons for doing this, um, you could be wanting to take your project and make sure that it's safe throughout the life cycle of the project, in which case you can archive it and go through multiple points to make sure you're always protected and always have a rollback point within the life cycle of that project. You can do that manually from the archive window, or you can build up a schedule and do it at a regular repeated pattern. So essentially you could do it every day at close of play or multiple times during the day, whatever pattern works for your operation. And of course, we'll only have put changes in each time we do that job. You could also choose to do it purely at the end of the job. So when you finish your project, you want to do it as a true archive and take everything and archive it off to the cloud storage so you know you have that archive of your project. Or you might want to do it as an interim of the two. So take your project, maybe the project work has stored for the moment, and you can actually move it all off into the cloud, remove it from your avid storage, free up the space, then bring it back um, in the future when you need to work on it again. So you could see it as either um, an archive tool, a backup tool, and be there for continuity, disaster recovery, or as I'm about to show, actual sharing of the projects. So we have the content. It's gone through into my archive. We have our projects in here. We have our versions. Um, and that's all available to this project parking to be brought back and worked on in the future. But because it's now in centralized storage and cloud storage, it's actually available to anybody else with a project parking application that you want to give access to that storage. So if I switch to a second machine, this machine is actually running in our office uh, 15 miles away, but we're configured to look into that same bucket. So we can still see the projects and we can still see the versions. Refresh. We can still see the versions that have gone up um, into the cloud, into the storage. So we'll see that new version that I've put up. This application could then also do the same action I saw within the main one. I can choose to restore and bring the project back down into my local system. Now in this case, I'm going from a different style of system. The source system um, was actually a standalone Avid. This one is a shared storage Avid. So I can actually remap the media locations to bring the media into how the correct uh, workspaces are going to be using in my Avid system. So in this case, I have my version. I can again see my bins and choose how much to work with. Flow with everything. And I'll see my workspaces detailed down here. And because this has come from a remote site, the workspace that the content was on and the source isn't available, so I can remap it to new workspaces. If the source had come from multiple workspaces, then I could go through and remap them all and bring them into the new location. If I was bringing them down into a local Avid storage, Avid system with local attached storage, we'd be using solo parking, and that would go through and bring everything down into the local drive, whichever was the attached drive, and bring the content down. And actually, that would handle any conversion into the folder structures that Avid uses. So it brings it down again. So in this case, we just go through, choose where we're going to bring the media, choose where we're going to bring the project, so I can bring the project back um, and merge it into an existing project, or can bring it back into a new location, make it um, come down fresh. Again, however I want to run. And then we'll just start the restore, and we'll go through and we'll bring the, um, the items back. Again, we'll check. If the media files are already there, we won't bring them down again. We'll just bring down what's new. But we'll bring down that latest version of the project files, so you always have the latest version of the project. So that's completed. I now have the latest version of the project down in my local system. I can open it within my media composer and start work on it. So that was a very simple way to allow the content to have come out and be shared across um, and be used in remote sites and multiple remote sites. And the extra feature that we have based on how we build that centralized archive 
is that these users can then push their changes back into that centralized archive. Because everything goes in as its own project version. It can go in as their clearly identified version. It won't copy any media back that's already there, just media that they've added. <clears throat> and they can make sure that what they're doing remains in sync and available to everybody else as well. And that's just a question of them repeating the same pattern we saw earlier. They go through to do their archive. They choose their, their storage destination. We know that it's already there. So we'll push the things back again. And then it's just a question of within your version, identifying it to make sure people know uh, where it's coming from, and we'll push it back again. And that goes back and puts the changes back into the central system. If there's been more media files added, they'll go through. If there's been no changes, then we'll only take a version of the project file and push that back into central system. So you very quickly and very easily have a collaborative workflow where everyone's working from the centralized copy of the content. This is all non-destructive. We only ever add new things in and new versions in. And as soon as those, those are put through, and as soon as those go, go in, they're then available to everybody else again. So it's a very simple workflow, a very powerful workflow to allow this content to be shared across multiple users in multiple locations. As we work in with cloud storage, these project parkings could be anywhere in the world. So that will push the changes back, and then they will become available back to the main system again. So this is a very simple workflow. It's just based on the standard functionality of project parking. There's no extra options to, to um, apply to use this. It's just us creating archives and restoring from archives. If I return back to my main application now, that's the archive, that's how we will <clears throat> we'll restore content. The other main feature that we have available within Project Parking is built on expanding the knowledge that we get from these projects and this understanding of the bins and the media files. Because we can re work out from a project level what media files are in use within the project, we can actually expand that and do an analysis of your entire Avid storage and see how everything's being used. And we call that storage analysis. This allows us to do a scan look at the media files, look at the projects, and see the comparison between the two, and see how things are utilized. So in this system, we can see the projects we've looked at, the workspaces that we've scanned, the media files we've found. And then we can find interesting things out. So we can find out just the number of files that are offline. So these are things we can see in projects that we can't find media files for. But probably more importantly, we can find duplicates and orphans. So the duplicates are files that are in more than one location within your Avid storage, which is not how Avid is supposed to work. And orphans are files which we can find in the media locations, but we can't find any reference to. And in this case, um, I'm running a non-interplay non system. So these are files that we can see in projects. So we can, these are files that we can see in the media locations, but we can't find a reference to them in the project files. If I was connected into interplay, then I'd cross-check this. This with interplay, and we'd see if they're in use in interplay as well. So we really do know whether the, that these files that we're showing as orphans should not be in the Avid system. And we show this information every time we do the scan, so we build up the historical picture, so you can see how your system is being used over time. And you can see at the top level, there's a summary, or in detail as a project or a workspace level, so you can see how everything's being used over time. Then obviously we've shown you the orphans and the, and the duplicates, so we'll also show you in the detailed section how to get those back, that space back. So you can remove duplicate files, and we can remove orphan files. And we're doing this, we know this is safe to do. In the case of duplicates, we know these are exactly the same files. We've checked. We've gone through down to um, internal ID levels to make sure these are the same. And when we're doing the uh, removal, we can even go forward and do an extra MD5 checksum to make sure these are exactly the same before we delete anything. Then in the case of the orphan files, we know these are safe to delete because these should not be there in the first place. But we'll still do this as a what we refer to as a sweep. So we'll copy them across to a secondary location and then remove them from the Avid storage. So you'd have a temporary fallback position if you just want to be particularly safe. So this analysis will show you the state of your system, show you things that shouldn't be in your storage system, and give you the tools to remove them. And it also then will give you tools to work at this kind of informa information at a project level. So once we know the analysis and how everything's linked together, we can also allow the options to do sweeps and deletes at a project level. So you can remove projects and their media from a system. And again, we know this is safe because we know the exact relationship between that project, its media, and how that media is in use by every other project. So we know that we would only ever delete content that is uniquely referenced by that project. 
to, again, it is safe to do. We are very safe with people's media. We always have rollback positions, and we always make sure that everything is um, only in use uniquely by that project. And as I mentioned um, earlier, when we build up lots of these tasks, we can do them manually, individually, or we can build up the scheduled jobs to actually have it happen on regular patterns. So you can do your storage analysis um, on a regular interval, do your project archives on a regular interval. We can go for and do projects in a bulk, so you can take a folder of your pro projects and do them all at the same time. Do just a single job if you're looking to do a mass archive or backup of your projects. Then we just have some extra tools to make things easier in terms of configuration and setting. So that completes my project parking demo. So back to you, Mark. Great. Thank you very much. Really interesting. Um, just had a question over a chat. Um, what's the minimum deployment of project parking? Well, project parking, the project parking that works with the shared storage systems um, is licensed by um, the connection into the AVID shared storage and it's sold in 16 terabyte chunks or priced in 16 terabyte chunks. So anything down to 16 terabytes would be the smallest. Solo parking is running on local standalone storage and is a flat price. That's um, just price with no reference to the storage. Okay, great, thank you. Um, well, we're at the uh, near the end now, so just the Q&A side of things. Has anybody got any questions for us? Feel free to uh, unmute and ask us anything you like or pop in the chat window, your choice. Well, all silent, which means that uh, we've obviously done a great job of explaining everything. Um, Yes, I'll just have to say thank you everyone for joining us. Hope it's been useful. Um, please do get in contact uh, with us if you want any further information or if you see a place for it with you or would you like a, an even deeper demo or dive into it. Uh, we'd be happy to do that for you um, on a personal one-to-one -one basis. Um, thank you, Simon, for joining us. And thank you to uh, both the Marquis and the Object Matrix team for helping us put this together. That's okay. Pleasure. No worries. Thank you, everybody, and uh, everybody, and uh, bye bye. Thanks very much.